A further and very noble evidence of the truth of the grand facts attested in the Old Testament and of the inspiration of a considerable part of it may be drawn from the consideration of those numerous and various predictions to be found in it, which refer to a multitude of events, several of them before utterly unexampled, which no human sagacity could possibly have foreseen, and which nevertheless happened exactly according to those predictions. Having advanced thus far, we may take up a set of arguments correspondent to those insisted on above to prove from its genuineness and credibility, now supposed to be evinced, that the Old Testament was written by a superintendent inspiration, and this we may argue not merely or chiefly from the tradition to this purpose, so generally and so early prevailing in the Jewish Church, though that is considerable nor even from those very signal and glorious internal evidences of various kinds, which every competent judge may easily see and feel, but from surveying the characters and circumstances of the persons by whom the several books were written, in comparison with the genius of that dispensation under which they lived and wrote. This may, in all the branches of the argument, be proved in this way, with the greatest ease and strength concerning Moses and his writings, when the authority of the Pentateuch is established, that of most material succeeding books stands in so easy and natural a connection with it that I think few have been found, at least since the controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans, who have in good earnest allowed Moses to have been a messenger from heaven and denied the inspiration of the prophets and of the books which we receive as written by them. But it is obvious that the illustration of all these propositions would be the work of a large volume, rather than of such a postscript to a dissertation itself of so moderate a length. I have discussed them all, with the most material objections which have been advanced against them, in the course of theological lectures which I mentioned in preface to the first volume, and which it is my continual care to render worthy the acceptance of the public in due time, by such alterations and additions as frequent reviews, in conjunction with what occurs to me in reading, conversation or meditation, may suggest. I shall conclude these hints with the mention of one argument for the inspiration of the Old Testament, entirely independent of all the former, which a few words may set in a convincing light, and which must be satisfactory to all who see the reasonableness of acquiescing in what I have urged above. I mean that the inspiration and consequently the genuineness and credibility of the Old Testament may be certainly inferred from that of the New, because our Lord and his apostles were so far from charging the scribes and Pharisees, who on all proper occasions are censured so freely, with having introduced into the sacred volume any merely human compositions that, on the contrary, they not only recommend a diligent and constant perusal of these scriptures, as of the greatest importance to men's eternal happiness, but speak of them as divine oracles, and as written by the extraordinary influence of the Holy Spirit upon the minds of the authors. I desire that the following list of scriptures may be attentively consulted and reflected on in this view. I might have added a great many more, indeed several hundreds, in which the sacred writers of the New Testament argue from those of the Old in such a manner as nothing could have justified but a firm persuasion that they were divinely inspired. Now, as the Jews always allowed that the testimony of an approved prophet was sufficient to confirm the mission of one who was supported by it, so I think every reasonable man will readily conclude that no inspired person can erroneously attest another to be inspired. And indeed, the very definition of plenary inspiration, as stated above, absolutely excludes any room for cavilling on so plain a head. I throw the particular passages which I choose to mention into the margin below, and he must be a very indolent inquirer into a question of so much importance who does not think it worth his while to turn carefully to them, unless he has already such a conviction of the argument that it should need no further to be illustrated or confirmed. John 5.39, Matthew 4, 4, 7 and 10, Mark 12.24, Luke 10.26 and 27, Matthew 5.17 and 18, 21.42, and 56, Luke 1.67, and 70, 16.31, 24, 25, and 27, John 10, 35, Acts 2, 16, and 25, 3, 22, and 24, 4, 25, 17, 11, 18, 24, and 28, 28, 25, Romans 3, 2, and 10, 
9, 25, 27, and 29, 10, 5, 11, and 16, 15, 4, 16, 26, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 13, 6, 16, and 17, Galatians 3, 1 Timothy 5, 18, 2 Timothy 3, 15, and 16, Hebrews 1, 1, 5 to 13, 3, 7, James 2, 8, 4, 5, and 6, 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21.